بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So today we'll be finishing up the story of Ali ibn Abi Talib and as I have done for the previous three خلفاء we will inshallah as well uh, go over some ahadith that have been narrated by Ali ibn Abi Talib. I feel that's also very important to get a bit of a uh, a sense of the narrations of, of the Sahabi And as well I think it's always barakah To listen to the hadith of the Prophet It's only nur ala nur We hear what the Prophet himself said uh, Obviously through the riwayah of Ali radiallahu And that's what we're going to be doing today So uh, we talked about the, the, the major incidents In the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib And unfortunately those incidents were internal battles We talked about uh, the, the battle of the Jamal The battle of the Camel We talked about Safin uh, We talked about Nahr these are really the major incidents. There was no major conquest against the non-Muslims during this time. Uh, the Islamic Empire did not really expand uh, in this era as it had expanded in the previous um, eras. And there are other side points about his fiscal policies and whatnot, which are not that relevant, inshallah. So I'm going to skip over that and really conclude with the death of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, the death of Ali ibn Abi Talib had been predicted by the Prophet wasallam to be an assassination. So the Prophet ﷺ had told Ali ibn Abi Talib, the hadith is in Mustad Imam Ahmad, it's also in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, that our Prophet ﷺ said, the worst of people in the previous generations is the one who hamstrung the camel, the camel of Salih. And the worst of people of the later generations is the one who shall stab you, O Ali. And he pointed to Ali, radiallahu anhu, and he pointed to where the stabbing will occur, and that is on the chest area. So he mentioned that somebody would assassinate or stab Ali ibn Abi Talib, and in fact, it is also reported in the Muslim Imam Ahmad uh, that one of the uh, Kharijites um, basically wished death for Ali. And Ali said that my death will come via a stabbing uh, or via a killing. This is what has been promised to me. So the uh, sorry, Ali radiallahu himself said that the Prophet told me that my death would come via an assassination. And after the battle of Nahrawan, which was, as we had mentioned, a resounding victory for Ali over the Khawarij, after the battle of Nahrawan, the Kharijites had to disperse in the land. They were not gathered together. And it is mentioned that a group of them, uh, basically, they, uh, two years later, they performed Hajj, and they gathered in Mecca, and under the shade of the Kaaba, astaghfirullah, they decided to assassinate the three most influential people of this ummah. And this shows us the problems of blind fanaticism and overzealousness. How could you discuss the killing of a Muslim, much less the killing of three sahaba in the Hajj season, in the shade of the Kaaba? And this is what shows you the, the fanaticism that we see in these crazy groups even until our time. And they decided that uh, they have to basically undertake a, a mission to kill, as we know the famous three were Muawiyah, Ibn Abi Sufyan, Amr ibn al-As, and Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so in the year 39 of the Hijrah, in the month of uh, Dhul Hijjah, they made up their minds that in Ramadan of the following year. And why did they choose Ramadan? Because Ramadan is when uh, the, the, the crowds are more and the security is lax. Ramadan is when even who's going to think of killing somebody in Ramadan. So they, they all decided that they're going to assassinate these three figures in Ramadan of the next year. And the three senior amongst them volunteered and they made a pact in front of the Kaaba. And they said, we have sold ourselves to Allah. And that's why they were called Ashura, those that have uh, sold themselves to Allah. So they called themselves Ashura. You can literally call it the suicide mission. It's literally the first suicide mission in Islam. That they realize they're most likely going to die. So they're selling themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows you the, the problems of craziness and fanaticism. And uh, of them was um, Al-Hajjaj al-Tamimi. Al-Hajjaj al-Tamimi, he was also called Al-Barq. He volunteered to assassinate Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And Amr ibn Bakr al-Tamimi, he volunteered to assassinate Amr ibn al-As. And the famous or the infamous Abd rahman ibn Muljim. Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, ibn Muljim is the famous person we've all heard of. He was the one who chose Ali ibn Abi Talib, that I will assassinate Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, this Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, subhanAllah, again, it shows you the dangers of fanaticism. He was actually a very well-known person. 
He wasn't some majhul, some unknown. He was actually a very well-known person. And he had come to Medina after the death of the Prophet ﷺ to study Islam. So he had come and he had studied under Mu'adh ibn Jabal. So he had studied a little bit of Qur'an and he became essentially a Qur'an teacher. And he then went to Egypt and he taught Qur'an over there for a period of time. Then he migrated to Kufa and he joined the army of Ali ibn Abi Talib and he fought in the battle of Safin. So he was known to Ali, Ali knew him radiallahu anhu. And when the arbitration took place, he joined the Khawarij. He broke away and he felt that basically uh, that uh, Ali radiallahu anhu had kind of betrayed Islam. And so he joined the Khawarij. And this shows us that the dangers, as I keep on saying, of religious fanaticism. You see, religious fanatics, the problem with them is that it is impossible to reason with them. Because they literally see the world... As if Allah is on their side and anybody who tries to talk to them is from shaitan's side. They cannot, usually, they cannot be reasoned with. They are so blind in their fanaticism, they actually believe that by killing people, by killing Ali radiallahu an, they're doing Allah's will. I mean, look at how crazy you must be to think that under the shade of the Kaaba, in the time of Hajj, you're doing a good deed by selling yourself to Allah. And you're going to go and you're going to assassinate, you know, the cousin and the son-in-law and the Amir al-Mu'mineen. And subhanAllah, then you worry and you, and you, and you wonder where ISIS comes from, where Kharijites come from. Yeah, look at these people. Wallahi, ISIS are babies compared to them. Right? To assassinate Ali ibn Abi Talib, what fanaticism must you have? Think about that. And these are people our ummah has demonstrated and shown. So you will find people like this, that they are completely, they've lost the plot. And by the way, religious fanatics in every single group, the Jews have them, the Christians have them, the Muslims have them, that they literally think they're doing the act of God when they do whatever they're doing. And these people, they, they reach a level of overzealousness that they lose touch with reality. And this is what we see over here. And unfortunately, many of them have a superficial level of religiosity. So you have this Ibn Muljim, He's not coming out of the blue. He's actually a Qur'an teacher in the time of the tabi'un. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal. He's not some, you know, jahil, ignor, ignoramus. He's actually, but what did the Prophet say? They would recite the Qur'an. He wasn't a faqih. He was simply a reciter. Right? They will recite the Qur'an. It won't get past their throats. Right? It's not going to impact them spiritually. So, Ibn Muljim and the three of them, they made this pact, they made that agreement in front of the Kaaba, and they decided that they're going to basically assassinate the three. As we know what happened with Muawiyah radiallahu an, uh, the, the uh, Al-Hajjaj al-Tamimi, he rushed uh, to try to stab Muawiyah. Uh, it was, um, they had basically agreed in the middle of Ramadan sometime, they're all going to attack. Um, as far as we know, they didn't agree to a particular date, but the point is that, you know, news would take at least a week to travel. So it's not as if they had to decide on one date. And it's just roughly, you know, in the middle of Ramadan or something, they're going to attack. So that's what seems to have happened, that in the middle of Ramadan, all three attacks were launched out. So as for Al-Hajjaj al he rushed in the mosque of Damascus, and he managed to graze the skin of Muawiyah radiallahu anh. But Muawiyah's entourage, the, the, the guards, they were very quick in reacting. And so they grabbed him and they stopped him. And so Muawiyah had a bruise or bleeding. It was cut. Um, there was a stab, but it was nowhere near fatal. It was simply a wound that healed with time. As for Amr ibn al-As, he fell sick. Qadr Allah. He fell sick the night before. And... He had a fever, so on the Fajr, he basically told one of his uh, yani people in the house to go lead the Salah. You know, everybody has their close friends and whatnot, or in, in the palace, wherever he was, he told one of the people to lead the Salah. So when this man exited, the Khariji attacked him, assuming that it was Amr ibn al-As, and he killed him. But Allah Azza wa Jal had willed that Amr be... Uh, yani not able to go to Fajr that day. So the Khadiji succeeded in killing somebody, but it wasn't Amr ibn al-As. Okay? And then of course, as for Abdurrahman ibn Muljim, uh, so Ali radiallahu anhu is in Kufa at the time. And so he came out for Salat al-Fajr, and before he could stand up and say the takbir, uh, Ibn Muljim rushed out of the crowd. He was obviously, you can imagine, this is the Masjid of Kufa. These are massive masajid, right? These are the biggest masjids of the world at that time. 
The Kufa is the capital, and Ali radiallahu is leading the salah in the in the largest masjid of Kufa, which is the capital of the Muslim world. You can imagine how big it's going to be. Who's gonna? And it's Fajr time. Who's gonna? You know, you cannot. You cannot monitor. You cannot take charge of each and every person. You know, even to this day, how much can the uh, haram monitor or whatnot? You cannot take care of one person. So he snuck into the crowd in the early pre-dawn, pre-fajr, and he went to the sufuf al-awwal, the first saf. And when Ali radiallahu came out, he quickly sprung forth and he shouted out, Al-Hukmu Lillah. And he looked again at the fanaticism. Huh? You're, you're, you're literally thinking that you're doing something for the sake of Allah. That Al-Hukmu Lillah, La Laka wa La Li Ashabik. That's his, that's his, what he stabbed Ali with. Judgment belongs to Allah. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to your friends and companions, right? So he literally thinks that Ali radiallahu anhu is now worthy of being killed in Salat al-Fajr because he has disobeyed Allah. Al-Hukmu lillah, as was the, the shi'ar or the logo or the mot- motto of the Khawarij. And he managed to stab him a few times, including the fatal stab, the most difficult stab, which was uh, in the upper area uh, of the chest. Some even say it went into uh, the head area. And to make matters worse, this was a dagger that had been dipped in and covered in poison. So it was a poisoned dagger. And according to one report, it was a double-edged one. Right, so uh, and one report says that he purchased a very fancy dagger for a thousand uh, dirhams, and then he had it uh, coated with poison for another thousand, too, because that's a very obviously black market thing to whatnot. So two thousand dirhams, which is a fortune, to get this instrument to kill Ali radiallahu an, and so Ali radiallahu fell down, and. Uh, Ali cried out that catch him, make sure he doesn't get away. And they did in fact catch him and they tied him up. Ali radiallahu anhu was rushed back to the, um, to the uh, house, to his house, uh, the residential palace if you like. And the doctors were called. Now remember this is Kufa. Kufa was a part of the Sassanid Empire. Kufa was Iraq. Iraq was the Sassanid Empire. And so the, the physician that was the chief physician of that city was actually one of the physicians of Kisra. So he was one of the physicians of Kisra, very well and he respected, if you like, uh, you know, well uh, knowledgeable person. And he looked at the wounds of Ali radiallahu an, and he basically said that, and he looked especially at the wound that was in the uh, the, the the head area, and he said, "Give your wasiya, you will not survive. We cannot do anything. This is beyond our." our, um, uh, you know, expertise. And so, Ali radiallahu an, he basically, um, he had another few day, a day or two, some say three days, he was in that painful wounded state, but basically two days or so. And he called his children, uh, and in particular, Hassan and Hussein and Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya. These three were the eldest of his children, male children. Of course, he had over 20, as we know, but these three were now senior, and they were the, the remnants, if you like, of the, uh, they're now going to take over the Al al-Bayt. And he advised them, the, the wasiya is mentioned in many books, it's generic advice, to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to treat orphans kindly, to never do dhulm to people, to take care of the family. It's all spiritual advice. And this is very beautiful, because... He is the Khalifa, and he's dying, and he's really concerned about the spiritual legacy of his children, right? In one report, it is even said that, make sure that you do wudu properly before you pray every single salah. I mean, this is his state of mind, that he wants his children to pray properly. This is what he wants them to um, do. And he also gave explicit advice regarding Ibn Muljim, Abdurrahman Muljim. And he said that, if I die, then kill him, execute him. And don't kill anybody else besides him. Don't go and attack the rest of the Kharijites. Don't go back and go to war with them. This one man killed me, you kill him back. And do not mistreat or torture or mutilate his body. For I heard the Prophet ﷺ forbid that. Don't go beyond. You have to execute, execute. But you don't torture in Islam. You don't mistreat. And you don't mutilate the body or the corpse. So he said... Yes, execute a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You execute him. But don't mistreat or torture him. And he said, "Is if I live, if I happen to live, then his affair is to me. I'll see if I want to forgive or if I want to execute. So he gave the wasiyah that if I die, then execute. If I live, then it's my, my choice. I'll decide what is to be done. But of course, he did not live. He passed away on the morning of the 21st of Ramadan in the year 40 AH. 
Okay, so he passed away in the uh, morning of the 21st of Ramadan, the last 10 nights of Ramadan he passed away uh, in the year 40 AH at the perfect age and the sunnah age of 63, which was also the age of the Prophet Sallallahu and also the age of Abu Bakr uh, As-Siddiq and now also Ali, uh, they all passed away at 63 exact. And he was in office for four years, nine months, and three days. So his term in office was longer than Abu Bakr and shorter than Umar and Uthman. So he was, in terms of length, Abu Bakr is the sh- shortest, and then Umar ibn Khattab, uh, sorry, and then Ali, and then Umar, and then Uthman. This is how, in terms of the length of Khilafah. And uh, when Ibn Muljim was brought to be executed, uh, he asked to speak to Hassan, Hassan ibn Ali, radiallahu anhu. And so, Hassan spoke to him and he said to Hassan, he said that I did indeed make a promise to Allah in the Hatim of the Kaaba. Yani the, the promise was in the Hatim. You know the Hatim, right? The semicircle. Like literally, it's not even just the shade of the Kaaba, it's literally inside the Kaaba. Right? Technically, it's inside the Kaaba. I made a promise to Allah in the Hatim that I would not die unless and until I kill. Both your father and Muawiyah. And I've succeeded with your father. Now I beg of you. Let me go. And I will take care of Muawiyah for you. And I swear to Allah my hardest oaths. My iman mughallah, the strongest oath. That either I die doing that. Or if I succeed, I will come back and put my hand in your hand. And you can do whatever you want after that. Yani literally the level, and do you think he was truthful when he made the promise? Yes. 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 He was absolutely truthful. I mean, Allah knows best, but it looks like that. Yeah. He literally was begging to go kill Muawiyah. Then he would walk back all the way to Kufa and say, Khalas, you can kill me now. Yani this is the level of fanaticism. How can you reason with these types of people? How can you have a, a, a conversation where you try to persuade them that they've gone beyond, you know, they've lost the plot? You can't. And of course, now why would he think Hassan would agree? Why would he think Hassan would, would agree? Friction. Because of the friction, exactly. Because of the friction. Like he knows that you don't believe in my methodology, but we know you don't like Muawiyah. And I'll get rid of him. Don't worry, that's my job. And I promise you, once I've done that, I'll come back and you can then kill me. And he, subhanallah, wallahi, is just really, you read these stories and you realize that, yes, indeed, there's something as fanaticism and overzealousness and the dangers of uh, this type of, of understanding. So, what do you think Hassan would say? You think he's going to agree to this? Of course not. He is the grandson of the Prophet I mean, There's no way. And he goes, no, and he goes, la abadan, until you see the fire of hell. Meaning, you're going to see Jahannam before I'm going to let you go. And that's exactly what happened. That of course, Abdul Rahman Muljim was uh, was uh, executed. Uh, and um, I mean, it is said that there is now a place of celebration by the other group. And I, I, I mean, I, uh, even if there is, these are some fanatics even within the other group. We should not smear the entire group because of them. But no doubt, um, that's not something that uh, you know we we uh, uh, consider to be uh, you know valid. Nonetheless, so Ali ibn Abi Talib, he was his janazah was prayed in the Masjid of Kufa. Now the big question arises: Where was he buried? Where was he buried? Believe it or not, there's a khtilaf. and nobody is certain to this day where his grave is. And Ibn al jawzi in his uh, tarikh, he has many different opinions. And he mentions that of the opinions was that he was buried in a garden outside the Masjid of Kufa. And another opinion is that he was buried at night outside of the residential palace of Kufa and they covered up his grave. And a third opinion is that he was actually taken to Medina and buried in Baqir. And a fourth opinion is that uh, uh, his body was put on a camel or a donkey and it just got lost in the night when it was just so nobody knows where it went. And this is a myth or a legend that is well known and people say this all the time. Ibn Kathir says that the strongest opinion was that he was buried next to the residential palace of Kufa, meaning not in the usual graveyard of the Muslims. He was buried next to the palace in a plot of land at night out of fear that the Khawarij would unearth his body and mutilate him. 
And as for the story that his corpse was put on a donkey and that it disappeared, this is a khata. It's not true. It's not true. And whoever narrates this is speaking without any knowledge, for neither common sense nor sharia would support such a story. And wallahi, this is true. Who is going to believe that the body of Ali radiallahu anhu was just put on a donkey and it just disappeared? And nobody would look after him. It doesn't make any sense. And really, there is no evidence for it in the books of history. Rather, what makes the most logical sense is exactly what Ibn Kathir said. There was a fear and a danger that the Khawarij would mutilate the body of Ali. That's how fanatical they are. We just saw Ibn Muljam's story. So they didn't bury him in the usual graveyard. And they didn't tell anybody else where he's buried. The immediate family, at night when nobody knows and whatnot, they went to a plot of land next to the house where he is. And they buried him right then and there. And therefore, because nobody knew other than the immediate family, and because they didn't put a marking on the grave, so obviously after a few generations, the place is now forgotten. Nobody knows exactly where it is. And obviously, so in all likelihood, it's in one of the busy suburbs of Kufa and downtown Kufa somewhere. And deep down underneath all of the highways and whatever, that's going to be where, that's where it has been since the last 14 centuries. Now, uh, the other group, the Shia, of course, they have a massive monument in Najaf. And they say this is the Mazar of Ali, Mazar Ali. And as we know, they make pilgrimages to these mazar. Uh, and this is a fact that they go to these mazars, they go to all of their imams from Ali all the way down. And they have their mini pilgrimages and they do their ziyarat uh, to, to, um, uh, to Karbala and to Najaf and whatnot. Uh, but we, Ahlul Sunnah, we Sunnis believe that this is simply not true. Ali radiallahu's body is not in Najaf. And in fact, Ibn Taymiyyah and other historians, they write that I mean, by consensus of all the people, Ali's body is not at the Mazar of Najaf. Rather, Ibn Taymiyyah writes that this was the Khabar of another Sahabi, uh, Mughira bin Shu'bah was another Sahabi. And in the time of the Buwayhids, which was one of the many dynasties of uh, the, the fourth century of the Hijrah, the Buwayhids basically uh, began to claim that this was the Mazar of Ali. Now the Buwayhids were a Shi'i dynasty. They were a 12 Shi'i dynasty and they, they were very very powerful in their time frame. So they were the ones who basically uh, made the, the Mazar of Najaf into Ali's alleged grave. But we do not believe this at all. It cannot really be Ali radiallahu's grave. It really must be in Kufa. There's really no other place than every bit of common sense and logic. What would Hassan and Hussein do? What would the Al al-Bayt, what would the family of Ali do? They would bury him right then and there, as is the Sunnah. The claim that they sent them to Medina, this is against the Sunnah. You don't send a corpse, right? A thousand mile journey. In the de- it just doesn't make any sense. What was the need to do that? You bury a person where he dies. And literally, next to the house, as the saying goes, they buried him in a plot of land that was unmarked. And that's the point, that it wasn't the typical graveyard. And that is why uh, the people are, are not, they did not count or they did not know where the body of Ali is. And so therefore, inshallah ta'ala, the correct position is that uh, Ali's grave, radiallahu an, is next to his residential palace, wherever it was, which was next to the Grand Mosque. So the original masjid of Kufa, and close to that was his, in front of it was his uh, palace, and in front, or, you know, we call it a palace. When I say palace, don't think of a, a multi-millionaire's palace. What, we call it the Qasr. That's, that's what you call the residential place of the Khalifa. So wherever was his uh, Qasr, next to that would have been a plot of land. That is where the Qabr is going to be. Uh, and um, one last point before we begin the hadith, that when he was being um, uh, buried, sorry, when he was on his deathbed, when he was on his deathbed, one of the Sahaba, Jundub uh, ibn Abdullah, came up to him on his deathbed. And he said that if you die, do you want us to give the bay'ah to Hassan after you? If you die, do you want us to give the bay'ah to Hassan after you? And Ali radiallahu anhu said, I am neither ordering you to do this, nor am I prohibiting you from doing it. I'm not going to say anything. And this is from his fiqh and from his understanding and from his taqwa that he didn't want to tell them. But at the same time, every father, nothing wrong with that. Again, this is natural as well. You don't want to say no as well. So he didn't command and he didn't 
prohibit. And we will get to the story of resuming the story, inshallah, at a, at a later date, inshallah, we'll come back to this. And of course, the, in a nutshell, يعني, the people of Kufa gave bay'ah to Hassan, and then the people of Syria said that Muawiyah is now the Khalifa, because the, 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 the battle was between Ali and Muawiyah. Now that Ali has passed away or has been killed, so then Muawiyah should then be elected or basically be upgraded. And so the people of Sham basically said, okay, well now it's a done deal, clearly you're the Khalifa. And so there were two Khalifas for a period of time. And uh, Hassan, then, uh, after six months, without any battle, he basically said, you know, okay, forget it, I don't want to have another bloodshed, and I'm going to step back. And so we'll get to that story when we get to it. Now we want to do some ahadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib. How many ahadith did he narrate? Um, so Ali radiallahu anhu narrated more than any of the other uh, four Khulafa. Uh, but still not as much as the major sahaba that of narrators such as Jabir ibn Abdullah and Aisha and Ibn Umar ibn Abbas. Ali radiallahu an, he has around, it is said, 500 ahadith without repetition. With repetition you get eight, 900. Repetition means the same as not goes in there. So around 500 ahadith without repetition. Okay, uh, And that is more than Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. Why is it more? Because he's living at a later time. He's living at a later time. And obviously the later you go, so then the more people preserve your narrations. I mean, um, Abu Bakr, he only was Khalifa for basically less than two years, right? And too busy. And who's going to be narrating, you know, at that? So because Ali lived longer, radiallahu an, and because he's obviously the last of the four to die, and also because he was a qadi, a judge, since the time of Umar, he had been appointed as a judge here and there. So he is now able to basically give his verdicts and give qada and whatnot. So many, many of the ahadith of Ali deal with fiqh. Many of them deal with fiqh because he is judging between people and so he's narrating to basically prove what he is saying. So inshallah we'll just begin now. Um, my, my habit is basically just to take the musnad of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Uh, and remember the musnad, uh, it, every book has its methodology and you to benefit you need to understand his methodology. So the beautiful thing about the musnad is that all of the ahadith of every companion are in one chapter. So we have the musnad of Abu Bakr, that's the beginning. Then the musnad of Umar, then the musnad of Uthman, then the musnad, the musnad of Ali ibn Abi Talib, right? And look, this is now volume 2. So all three sahaba are in volume 1. And this entire volume is Ali ibn Abi Talib. What does that show you? Right? Shows you the quantity, right? This is volume 2. You see it, volume 2 over here. This is volume 2. By the way, Musnad Imam Ahmad is 45 volumes like this, plus 5 volumes of indexes. It's 50 volumes in print. 50 volumes. This is the largest book of hadith that is in print. There is no book that has more a hadith than Musnad Imam Ahmad. Uh, and it is, generally speaking, a reliable book, but it's not to the level of sahih. So not every hadith is sahih. You get some that are Hassan, some that are da'if, and very, very few that are fabricated. Very few that are fabricated. But that's a, overall a very reliable book. So it's beautiful because I don't need to go hunting where Ali ibn Abi Talib's hadith are. They're all here. But then the negative aspect of the Musnad is it's not arranged according to, according to what now? Topics. Topics. Completely random. Because that's not the goal of the Musnad. How is Sahih Bukhari arranged? Topics, Sahih Muslim, topics, Abu Dawood, topics, Nisa'id. That's why these books are more user-friendly for the average beginning student of knowledge. Because you can look up the topic and then read your hadith. Right? Each one has chapter headings, look it up. But the Musnad is not user-friendly for the guy who wants specific knowledge. Because that's not, you cannot look up. And that's why, by the way, there have been... There have been attempts throughout Islamic history to redo the Musnad according to chapters of, chapters of, topic, right? And interesting, just a little tidbit here, um, the most, the most comprehensive re-editing of the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, it was done by uh, Abdurrahman al-Banna, who is the grandfather of Hassan al-Banna. The famous Hassan al-Banna. His grandfather was of the Mashayikh of Azhar. One of the very famous scholars of Azhar. And he went through the entire Musnad. And this is back in the 1800s. 
when there were no computers, no fancy tabaat, no good editions, he went through the entire musnad and rearranged it according to topics. Amazing effort and work. And I have that book at home. Unfortunately, the printing of it is still very old. They haven't really updated the printing. But so somebody really needs to do that. Nonetheless, it is there and it has been printed. So what I'll do inshallah ta'ala is that I'll basically go over various hadith uh, and that will be our uh, lecture for today. So uh, the first hadith we'll do is Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, uh, saying that when I performed hajj with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ هَذِي أَيَامُ أَكْلٍ وَشُرْبٍ فَلَا يَصُمُّهَا أَحَدٌ That uh, on the day Days of Mina, the Prophet ﷺ announced, and I started with this hadith because we're in the days of Mina. So alhamdulillah, we coincided with the days of Mina. So Ali is saying, when I performed Hajj with the Prophet ﷺ, he had this announcement made that, O oh people, these are the days of eating and drinking, so let nobody fast during these days. So the Hujjaj do not fast in the days of Mina. They're not supposed to fast in the days of Mina. Uh, scholars differ, is it haram or is it makrub? But that's besides the point. The point is, you're not, these are the days of eating and drinking. Do not fast on the days of uh, Mina. Uh, uh, the other hadith will do. Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, said that I would come upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his house. And if he was praying when I visited him, he would say, subhanallah, sabbah ali. And that would be the indication that I may enter. And if he was not praying, then he would open the door for me. Meaning, Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib is saying that, uh, well, firstly, look at his access. You know, that's a very privilege just to be able to go to the house. And secondly, he's saying that essentially you are allowed to say subhanallah in the salah to indicate something. And this is something that we all know from basic fiqh. We should all know this, that if you are in salah and you need to alert somebody Outside of salah, you need to alert your child or your friend or whatever. You need to so you're allowed to you're allowed to motion by the way, and you're allowed to say Subhanallah. Okay, so for example, for example, if one of the children is doing something you know somewhat dangerous, you can make a a motion to somebody else Subhanallah Subhanallah that go and take care of the child. Okay, this is allowed to do. Or anything of this nature. So this is what Ali is trying to, radiallahu anhu, is trying to convey that the Prophet would say, Subhanallah, and when I heard Subhanallah, I would know he's in salah, so then I can enter. Uh, and even Ali, radiallahu anhu, has to knock to ask permission, because obviously Aisha is not his mahram mother, so even he has to knock to get permission to um, enter. Um, and uh, the next hadith that uh, Ali, radiallahu anhu, said, one day the Prophet visited me while I was sleeping, and Fatima was next to me, and this was at night. And he came to the door, and he knocked on the door, and we allowed him to come in, and he saw us basically lying down. And of course, this is Fatima's his father. This is like, you know, it's not, these are family members. Ali, of course, Ali is almost like a son, because remember, he has been raised in the house of the Prophet. So realize there is this understanding that obviously close family members have. So he saw them basically lying and sleepy. So he said to them, Ala tusalliyan. Aren't you praying? What should they be praying? Tahajjud. Aren't you praying like he's disappointed? Like they should be praying. And so Ali radiallahu said that, I responded and I said, Ya Rasulullah, Inna nufusana biyadillah. Our arwah are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He takes them and he decides when to send them back. Meaning? It's not my fault I'm sleeping. Right? It's not my fault Allah takes my ruh and then he, he sends it back when he wants to send it back. Right? Uh, and so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, turned back and, and headed back to his house. And he started uh, putting his hand on his thigh. Like, you know, when you're irritated or frustrated, like you're like, oh my God, really like that. So he's putting his hand on his thigh, and he said, وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ أَكْثَرَ شَيْءٍ jadala." That men are so good at knowing how to argue. Like, I'm asking him, praying to Hajj, he says, Allah Azza wa Jal has me sleep. It's not my fault, right? And so the process of just, you know, put his hand on his thigh and said, وَكَانَ Which is very beautiful. Like, he's not reprimanding them. He's not getting angry. But there is this natural frustration that the Prophet wants them to have a higher maqam. By the way, they're newlyweds, they're very young. Obviously, Ali radiallahu later on in his life, he's praying to Hajj. Right now we're talking about, you know, when he's 
a newlywed, he's in Medina now, this is a different time and place. And no doubt when a person gets older, then uh, generally speaking their religiosity and their ibadat increase. This is now, he is still uh, at a time of his life where uh, he's not doing this. So nobody should assume that Ali did not pray to Hajjud. This is at one phase of his life. Then obviously he himself is going to grow uh, spiritually and uh, whatnot. On the next hadith, Ali radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would take a ghusl with his wife or with his family from one container. Now because Ali is from the Al al-Bayt, he knows these things. Not that he's witnessing them, he knows these things. And this is one of the evidences that is used uh, that... Uh, the husband and wife can even take a ghusl together because it is authentically narrated. Ali is not the only one to narrate this. Umm Salama narrates it. Aisha narrates it. So from the wives themselves, they narrate this as well. Uh, the next hadith will do that um, Abdullah ibn Zurayr said that I entered in upon Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, on the day of Eid al-Adha. So we just passed by Eid al-Adha. And uh, he presented me with some dried bread to eat. So I said to him, Aslahak Allah, may Allah Azza wa Jal make your affairs better. Why don't you give us some of the meat? So this visitor is demanding higher quality food because Allah Azza wa Jal has given so much to you. So you are the Amir, the Khalifa, you're what not? I mean, you're giving me some dried bread. And so Ali radiallahu anhu said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, it is not allowed for the ruler to take anything from the money of Allah except two morsels. One morsel for himself and his family and one morsel he gives to the people who need. So Ali radiallahu anhu is living a very, very below average simple life even though he has all of that wealth. And this is why this is the Khulafa al-Rashidun. This is why they are. Because this is going to change. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, all four of them, this is how they lived. All the money that was in the Baytul Mal, they didn't even have a desire for it. It was not even something they're interested in. And they genuinely felt it's haram for me to take more than what I need. They felt that it's not allowed for me to take more than what I need. And so Allah Azza wa Jal blessed the Ummah uh, to what it was um, blessed with. Um, Ali narrates that, My eyes never suffered any problem, any issue, ever since the Prophet ﷺ spit into them. Remind me, when did this happen? Khandaq. (laughs) See, even he knows. (laughs) Khaybar. Khaybar, not Khandaq. Khaybar, Khaybar. لو عطينا الراية غدا رجل يحب الله ورسوله. Right, you يحب الله ورسوله. That's a Khaybar, the Raya. Yes. So at Khaybar, as we remember the story of Khaybar, when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, said that tomorrow you will get victory and I'll give the the, the flag to somebody who who will give you victory at his hands. And Allah loves him and he loves Allah. The Messenger loves him and he loves the Messenger. Everybody thought it would be wanted to be him. And it was Ali, he was sick, he was brought by some people because his eyes had an infection, they were closed. So the Prophet ﷺ spit into his eyes. And they became fine. So this is the statement, it's not a hadith, it's Ali saying that my eyes never had any complaint after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa spit into them. وعن علي رضي الله عنه قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يوتر في أول الليل وفي وسطه وفي آخره ثم ثبت له الوتر في آخره. Ali narrates that the Prophet would pray witr sometimes in the beginning of the night, sometimes in the middle of the night, and sometimes in the end of the night, and then eventually he would always pray at the end of the night. Meaning, in his lifetime, the Prophet would pray all three. But then eventually, what was his custom and habit, was that the witr should be at the end of the night. Now, what does witr here mean? Remember in Ramadan, we always go over this. Witr is really the tahajjud salah. And the witr, when it is mentioned in the hadith, typically it means tahajjud. Because the witr is connected to the tahajjud. And the process would pray tahajjud and witr together. We, because we are lazy, all of us, we can't pray the whole tahajjud. So what do we do? We cut out the tahajjud and we just jump to the last and we call that the witr. Which is fine. There's no sin as we know. 
And that's fine to do. But when Ali رضي الله is saying witr, he means tahajjud. And we learn from the sunnah, and this is uh, unfortunately something that, wallahi, it's so easy, but we are so lazy. May Allah forgive us. For those who are not able to pray tahajjud at the end of the night, it is completely permissible and better than nothing to pray tahajjud before going to sleep. It is allowed and sunnah, but not the best sunnah. It is permissible and sunnah to pray tahajjud before going to sleep. And that will constitute tahajjud. It will constitute tahajjud. But it's not the best tahajjud. But still, some tahajjud is better than nothing. Right? And this is what this hadith is saying. That you can pray tahajjud in the beginning of the night. And that's jaiz. And Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, that was his sunnah. That Abu Hurairah would always pray tahajjud, the last thing that he did before going to sleep. So he would typically not get up at the end of the night, he would stay awake to as much as he could, and then pray tahajjud and then go to sleep. And that would he would consider this to be his tahajjud. And that's valid, and it is tahajjud. It is tahajjud. And that's what this uh, narration of uh, Ali is saying. Um, وَعَنْ عَلِيٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنُهُ قَالَ قَالَ لِيَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَا عَلِي أَسْبِغِ الْوُضُوءَ وَإِنْ شَقَّ عَلَيْكَ وَلَا تَأْكُلِ الصَّدَقَ وَلَا تُنْزِلْ حَمِيرَ عَلَى الْخَيْرِ وَلَا تُجَالِسْ أَصْحَابَ النُّجُومِ Interesting hadith that the Prophet is saying, O Ali, I want you to note a number of things. Firstly, perfect your wudu even if it's difficult for you to do. Perfect your wudu even if it's difficult. Secondly, do not eat from sadaqah. And this sadaqah is zakat. As we know, that the al al-bayt are not allowed to eat zakat. They cannot take from zakat. And do not cause horses and, um, uh, ho- horses and donkeys to mate together. That is a fiqh issue uh, that in our sharia, we're not supposed to have cross-species mating together. Uh, and that's something that goes to the books of farming and whatnot. Uh, by the way, what happens when a horse and a and a donkey mate? You get the mule. You get the mule. And al-bighal, al-bighal. Now, al-bighals are halal to possess. We can purchase bighals, but it's not something that we should uh, do as owners. That's a, a fiqh issue when it comes to animals and plants and whatnot. There's chapters, believe it or not, there's chapters of fiqh about plants and animals and farming and irrigation and agriculture, even agriculture and irrigation. Sahih Bukhari has a book of irrigation and that's something most of us don't even think about. But imagine 100 years ago, 500 years ago, you needed to know these things. You know, As for us, we need to know the fiqh of buyur and transactions and credit cards and whatnot, which is whole different. In any case, and do not sit with fortune tellers. Do not sit with fortune tellers. Those people who think they know the future, don't sit with them. Or they pretend to know the future. Because in our sharia, we believe that this is all from shaitan. So do not sit with these people that are uh, fortune telling. When Ali radiallahu anhu qal, kana akhiru kalami rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as-sala, as-sala, wa attaqullaha fi ma malakat aymanukum. This is the famous hadith, many of us know it. It is narrated by Ali. Because he was there as well. Ali radiallahu anhu said, the last statement that came from the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu was, as-salah, as-salah, and fear Allah with what your uh, right hands possess. This was the last command that he gave. This is not the last words that came from his mouth. Because the last words that came from his mouth are what? Fir rafiq al-a'la. Okay, that's the last words that came from his mouth. But this is the last command that he gave to the uh, to the Sahaba that as salah as salah, and what that means is uh, basically beware of the salah, be cautious of the salah, guard the salah. Wa an Ali radiyallahu anhu qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam man qutila duna malihi fa huwa shahid. Whoever dies defending his property or his money dies the death of a shahid. So anybody who dies in self defense. Insha'Allah, he gets an upgrade to the level of shaheed. Anybody who dies defending, and it's not just the money. In one hadith, whoever dies defending his family, whoever dies defending himself, whoever dies defending his property, dies the death of a shaheed. So this is, we said many times in the, when we did the khataras, that the shaheed, Allah Azza wa Jal has blessed 
to be more than just the one who dies on the battlefield. So this is one of those that uh, when we hear of something, may Allah protect all of us, but sometimes people die in, in, in these type of tragedies. So we will upgrade, inshallah, their level. Uh, in the eyes of Allah, their janazah is the same, but in the eyes of Allah, they become a uh, shaheed. Uh, and uh, a man from Habadan came and asked Ali radiallahu an, what did the Prophet ﷺ send you with in Hajjatul Wada? What did he send you with when he sent you for the Hajj? Uh, not the Hajj of the, the Hajj that was with Abu Bakr so the ninth year of the Hijrah. So Ali said that the day that the Prophet ﷺ sent me to Abu Bakr in Hajj, he sent me with four things to announce. Four things to announce. Number one, that nobody will enter Jannah except for a mu'min. Number two, no tawaf shall be done while they are Naked. Because remember the Jahili Arabs did what? No one shall do tawaf iryan. Number three, whoever has a treaty with the Prophet ﷺ, that treaty will expire as soon as the expiration clause is in there. It's not going to be renewed. What is the point here? The pagans have to be, have to be leaving. You cannot be a mushrik and be in Mecca anymore. And number four, no mushrik will ever do hajj from this year onwards. Now remember, in the ninth year of the Hijrah, it was the only year that Muslims and non-Muslims performed Hajj together. Only year. Because in the eighth year, it was only non-Muslims. Hmm? In the ninth year, was the only year in human history where there were Muslims and non-Muslims together. But in that year, certain laws were said. Of those laws, of course, there are no idols anymore in Mecca, correct? That's already in, in, in the Fatah, correct? In that year, the tawaf naked was banned. Because you cannot allow this in Islam. But you still had non-Muslims. So they were told, you're not going to enter Jannah, except if you convert. And they were told that your treaties are all going to expire at the expiration clause. Don't assume... That is going to go on. This is now the end. Every ahd, every treaty with every tribe had a clause in it. Now it's going to expire. And then no more non-Muslims allowed for hajj. Okay, so this was Ali radiallahu anhu. And we did this when we did the seerah. That Abu Bakr was the leader of the hajj. And Ali radiallahu anhu was the one sent to give these announcements to the, uh, to the uh, hujjaj. Uh, and... Uh, Ata ibn Sa'ib narrates from Ali ibn Abi Talib that uh, Ali and Fatima asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for a servant. They were in dire need, meaning that they were uh, getting tired of household labor. And so Ali radiallahu anhu said to Fatima, why don't you ask your father for a slave? And it had just happened that he had received a large amount of money and slaves from one of the conquests towards Bahrain. And so... Uh, they sent a message that, can we get one of the servants, right? And the Prophet wasallam said, and what a powerful and beautiful hadith. لَا أُعْطِيكُمْ وَأَدَعُ أَهْلَ الصُّفَّةِ تَلَوَّى بُطُونُهُمْ مِنَ الْجُوعِ How can I give you? I'm not going to give you. And the Ahl al-Suffa, their stomachs are gurgling from the hunger. How can I give you a servant? And he, subhanAllah, this is... Beyond a doubt, this is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The daughter is complaining. In one riwayah, in one version, she actually says, "My hands are now, you know, um, what do you call the skin that comes and all that, just chaffed or whatnot, you know? My hands have become rough and coarse because I have to always do the, you know, the dough and whatnot." And we are working all day. Now, Ali was very poor in the beginning. You know, he was very poor. I mean, Abu Talib did not leave him any money. Remember, Abu Talib is leaving him nothing. And so he is starting with, remember when he proposed to Fatima, what did he have to give? Nothing. Then the Prophet reminded him, don't you have uh, an armor that we gave you in the Ghanimah? So then Uthman, remember the story. He had no money. So they're asking their father and father-in-law for a servant. And the Prophet says, how can I give you a servant? When the people of Suffa can't even feed themselves. No, I'm not going to give you. Subhanallah. What can we, I mean, this is Rasulullah. And this is, the, without a doubt, the example and the role model that we uh, look up to. Um, 
Abu Juhayfa narrated that we asked Ali radiallahu an, do you have any special knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ gave you other than the Quran? Pause here. Even in the time of Ali radiallahu an, extremism against him and for him had begun. Now we talked extremism against him. The Kharijites are an example. We did not talk about the extremism for him in this lecture, but I have spoken about this in other lectures here at MIC. And this is the beginning of what is called ghulat uh, tashayyur These are the extreme Shia. Modern Shia are twelver Shia. They are a different strand of Islam. In the beginning, you had extremist Shia called the ghulat. And the ghulat Shia, they began praising Ali above even level of shirk, even level of kufr. And this is in his lifetime it began, in his own lifetime. And that is why these questions that are found, are now you understand why. That they began to claim that Ali radiallahu anhu is a manifestation of God. They began to claim that he is this and he is that and he has ilm al ghaib And he controls this and he does. This is in his own lifetime. And so, Abu Juhayfa is saying that, when we, I want to ask you, do you have any knowledge other than what we all know of the Qur'an? And Ali ibn Abi Talib said, لا والذي فلق الحب وبرأ النسم He's giving a qasam by the one who opens up the seas, by the one who uh, creates the creation. I don't have any knowledge. إلا فهم يؤتيه الله عز وجل رجل في القرآن Except for my own understanding that Allah blesses with the Qur'an. And what I have written on a piece of paper. They said, what is written on this sahifa? What is written? So he said, I wrote down the, uh, the, the aql. Uh, the aql here means the dia or the, uh, the blood money. So blood money in Islam, it's a long list. If somebody harms you, right? How much you're going to give. So for a finger is this, and for this is that, and for a life is this. It was a long list. And actually there are a hadith where the Prophet gave a list. This is what is to be given. So Ali said, I wrote this down. I wrote this down. And I also wrote down, وَأَلَّا يَقْتُلَ مُسْلِمٌ بِكَافِرٌ I wrote down a hadith that uh, the Muslim is not to be killed in retaliation for a kafir. Now this Islamic fiqh where essentially... Uh, the Muslim who commits a, 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 a crime of murder uh, is going to be punished in different ways uh, if it is against a non-Muslim. And this is majority fiqh. There's even some ikhtilaf even in this. But the point is that this is where this opinion comes from that he says he wrote it down. Uh, Ali radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet ﷺ sent me and al Zubair ibn al-Awwam and al-Miqdad and this is uh, before the conquest of Mecca. And he said, go to Rawdata Khakhin, which is one of the areas of Medina, and you will find in it a caravan with a woman, and stop her and get the parcel from her. Pause here. Does anyone remember, remember this story? The time of conquest of Makkah. Before the conquest of Makkah, right? So Jibreel came and told the Prophet ﷺ, you better stop that lady in that caravan, because she is going to expose the secret. So who did the Prophet ﷺ send? Ali and Miqdad and Zubair. So Ali is narrating the story in the first person. This is the story now. So he said, Ali is saying, the Prophet ﷺ sent me, and we, stop, we, we went until we got to Rodha the Khaf, and we saw Khaf, and we saw the, the caravan, and we saw the lady, and we said, give us the parcel, give us the document. And the lady said, ما معي من كتاب? I don't have anything. And Ali said, Wallahi la tukhrijun. You will either give it to me, or I will search you top to bottom. Means there is no way out. Now obviously, she doesn't have anything. And so she took it out of, where did she take it out of? Her hair. It was in the middle of her hair, subhanAllah. Huh? So she took it out of her uh, hair, and we brought her, and we brought the book or the, the kitab to the Prophet wasallam. And in that was written, from Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, to so and so from the uh, people of Mecca, and he's telling them that the Prophet is going to leave to conquer. Remember the story, right? And then the story goes on, Ya Hatib, why did you do this? And the Hatib said, Ya O Messenger of Allah, don't be hasty before you judge me. Uh, I was a person who got attached to the Quraysh, I was not a part of the Quraysh, and I am not from their elite. And your other muhajireen, they have plenty of relatives who are going to protect their family that remains in Mecca. As for me, I don't have any relatives. And 
I wish that through this letter, my family in Mecca would be protected. You know the story, I said it You know, long, in, when we did the conquest of uh, Mecca. And I didn't do that as a kafir, nor because I left the religion, uh, nor because I hate kufr over, or I love kufr over Islam. And he had in his mind that Allah will somehow protect the messenger. Some, some ta'wil he had, some you know, interpretation that he had. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hatib has spoken the truth. And Umar wanted to execute him as a munafiq. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hatib has witnessed the battle of Badr. And how do you know, O Umar, that Allah Azza wa Jal has not looked at the battle of uh, the people of the battle of Badr and said, Do as you please, I have forgiven all of you. So because of his Badr status, the Prophet ﷺ overlooked this uh, uh, crime and it was indeed a a uh, crime. Uh, عن علي رضي الله عنه قال كنت عند النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأقبل أبو بكر وعمر فقال يا علي هذان سيدا كحول أهل الجنة وشبابها بعد النبيين والمرسلين Very beautiful hadith Here Ali رضي الله عنه is narrating is narrating to his followers in his khilafa he is saying I was sitting with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and Abu Bakr and Umar came and the Prophet ﷺ said to me, O oh Ali, these two men are the leaders, Sayyida, of all of the old and young people of Jannah after the Nabiyyin and Mursaleen. So Ali radiallahu anhu is narrating the fadila of Abu Bakr and Umar. And he is saying that, and we believe this, that Abu Bakr and Umar are Sayyida Kahuri Ahl Jannah. They are the leaders of the elders of the people of uh, Jannah. وعن علي أن فاطمة وعن علي أن فاطمة أتت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم تستخدمه فقال ألا أدلك على ما هو خير لك من ذلك تسبحين ثلاثا وثلاثين وتكبرين ثلاثا وثلاثين وتحمدين ثلاثا وثلاثين أحد أم أربعا وثلاثين علي said that فاطمة went to the process of requesting a خادم so this is the same hadith but he gives an extra thing the process did not give them a خادم but what did he say Shouldn't I tell you something better than that? Before you go to sleep, say Subhanallah 33 times, Allahu Akbar 33 times, and Alhamdulillah 33, or in one version 34 times. So the Prophet ﷺ, instead of giving them a, a servant, he told them to establish a regular sunnah. He told them to establish regular sunnah, and that regular sunnah is before you go to sleep, make sure you do these adhkar, 33, 33, and then 34. That is the correct position of the riwayat. Say this, and we should all make this a sunnah, and uh, we should all make this a sunnah, and it's something that is well tested and tried. This will give you more rizq than a khadim. This will give you more sustenance, more money will come to you. And this is tested and tried. People have done this throughout our history. And when you start doing it, you will see for yourself, your risk will increase. How can it not? When the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm telling you something better than a servant for you. So before we go to sleep, every one of you start making this your habit. Subhanallah, 33 times. Alhamdulillah, 33 times. Uh, Allahu Akbar, 34 times. Or sorry, 33 Allahu Akbar and 34 Alhamdulillah. Both are narrated. They're both narrated in this manner. Do these adhkar before going to sleep. Uh, وعن علي uh, uh, خطبنا قال sorry uh, خطبنا علي فقال من زعم أن, أن عندنا شيئا نقرأه إلا كتاب الله وهذه الصحيفة وهي صحيفة فيها أسنان الإبل وأشياء من الجراحات فقد كذب قال وفيها قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم المدينة حرم ما بين عين إلى ثور فمن أحدث فيها حدثا أو آوى محدثا فعليه لعنة الله وملائكة والناس أجمعين So Ali is giving khutbah and he says whoever thinks that I have any knowledge other than the book of Allah and this parchment that I have written down then he is lying and on this parchment, and he said, some of the things I wrote down, is the Prophet Wasallam saying that Medina is sacred. Medina is a haram. From the mountain of Ayr to the mountain of Thawr, whoever does any crime in it shall have the curse of Allah and the Malaika and all of uh, mankind. So once again, we have this, that Ali radiallahu anhu did not have any special wasiyah. He did not have any special legacy, special knowledge, but he did write down some ahadith. And he narrated these ahadith. These are what I have. And of them is this hadith that we just uh, narrated right now. Wa Ali in qal 
اذا حدثتكم عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حديثا فلا ان فلا ان اخر من فلا ان اخر من السماء احب الي من ان اكذب عليه واذا حدثتكم عن غيره فانما انا رجل محارب والحرب خدعه سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول يخرج في آخر الزمان أقوام أحداث الأسنان سفهاء الأحلام يقولون من خير قول البرية لا يجاوز إيمانهم حناجرهم فإنما لقيتموهم فاقتلوهم فإن قتلهم أجر أجر لما فإن قتلهم أجر لمن قتلهم يوم القيامة. So Ali رضي الله عنه said if I ever narrate to you something from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم then I would rather fall from the heavens, basically come and crashing down, than lie. I'm never going to lie. And if I say anything else, then sometimes I'm at war, and war involves trickery and deceit. Meaning, my narration of the Prophet system is to a different level. And everything else is a different level. This doesn't mean astaghfirullah that he's lying. But as we said, tawriya and whatnot is allowed when it comes to... And, and he was at war multiple times. And he's also talking about the khawarij. Right now he's going to talk about the khawarij. So he's saying that, look, sometimes you might, you know, I might say something about a tactic or something, and that's uh, khida, that's a, a, a type of tactic. But here I'm quoting you a hadith. I heard the Prophet wasallam say, that there shall come a people towards the end of times that are hudathaw al-asnan means young teeth means young in age sufaha al-ahlam foolish dreams so quite literally they're a bunch of overzealous kids young people and the khawarij generally speaking were not from the senior sahaba they were generally speaking new converts and young doesn't just mean young in age. It also means young in wisdom, young in maturity, young in knowledge. So people that are young, and they have crazy dreams. So fahaul ahlam. And again, wallahi, you look at these modern weirdos, the modern kharja, and the same thing. Wallahi, the same thing. They, they literally believe they'll establish a utopia. Uh, after all that's going on, they're going to establish a khilaf in the middle of Iraq and Syria. I mean, no clue as to how the world is run. No clue, no vision about running a country. And they think that somehow everything will be fine. And as we see, they're losing currently or not. And this is the reality of what's going to happen to them. يَقُولُونَ مِنْ خَيْرِ قَوْلِ الْبَرِيَّةِ They seem to be speaking the best speech. So their words are mesmerizing. You listen to some of them online, you listen to some other guys, yani even the, the, the cleric that was assassinated by America, disagreed with him. And may Allah Azza wa Jalla, Allah is in charge of his affairs, we have nothing, no, nothing negative against him in the Akhirah, may Allah Azza wa Jalla forgive, but in this world, he left a legacy that is definitely a very convoluted one, and I mean, uh, awlaki, um, May Allah Azza wa Jal deal with him yani in the matter of mercy in the Akhirah. We have nothing but uh, in the Akhirah, we don't want anything to harm any Muslim. But he left a legacy that is very problematic. You listen to much of his speech, wallahi, it is very mesmerizing. Very mesmerizing. It's very catchy. But in the end of the day, what is he asking people to do? Not just him, everybody of that, of that mindset. It's to kill other people. That's the ultimate goal of these people. So, the, uh, But when they couch it in this language of bravery and fighting and jihad and what not and bringing the khilafah you know 19 year old kid is hooked because he thinks he's going to do something and that's what the Prophet is saying they're young in age very naive in their understanding and their speech is mesmerizing but iman does not go beyond their throats Meaning they haven't absorbed, they haven't acted. It's just talk, no action. It's not in the qalb. It's just talk, no action. So if you meet these people, then kill them. Like the Nahrawan. For in killing them will be a reward on the day of judgment. So these are authentic hadith that Ali radiallahu anhu is uh, narrating about the khawarij. And that's why he is saying in the beginning of this that, look, this is a hadith I would never lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you about a hadith. This is what I heard the Prophet ﷺ say. وعن علي قال كنت رجلا مذاء فاستحييت أن أسأل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقلت للمقداد سلي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن المذي فقال فسأله فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فيه الوضوء. 
Ali radiallahu anhu is saying, I was a person who suffered from pre-seminal fluid. I would get pre-seminal fluid all the time. And I was embarrassed to ask the Prophet wasallam, what should I do when this happens? Why was he embarrassed? Because he's married to Fatima. So he's embarrassed to ask his father-in-law about this personal issue. What should I do? So I asked Miqdad. Miqdad was a close sahabi and a friend of Ali. To go and ask the Prophet on my behalf. So Miqdad went to the Prophet and said, What should a man do when he gets that pre-seminal fluid coming out? What should he do? And so the Prophet said, Fihi al-wudu. It's no ghusl, it's just wudu. You don't have to ghusl, it's just uh, wudu. And by the way, from a fiqhi perspective, as well, if that uh, liquid... Uh, if it has touched your garments, then you should sprinkle it with water uh, because that is also considered to be najis, uh, uh that that should not be prayed in that garment. Uh, uh, Ali said, O Messenger of Allah, why do you choose women from uh, the Quraysh, but you leave our women, meaning the Banu Hashim. Why are you choosing wives, but not from the Banu Hashim? So Ali wanted the Prophet to marry a Hashimite, because still, it's natural, we want to have more uh, of our women uh, in your household. We want to have a Banu Hashim in your household. So the Prophet said, do you have somebody in mind, like where are you asking this question? And he said, yes, I have the daughter of Hamza, why don't you marry the daughter of Hamza? Pause you, who can remind me? When did the daughter of Hamza, her story? We went over this. Very good, Al Khalat bin Manzil Um, but when did this happen? This is after the conquest of Mecca. After the conquest of Mecca. The daughter of Hamza, of course Hamza, where is Hamza now in the conquest of Mecca? He's passed away. Her mother is a pagan, she's a Muslim. Okay? And she does not want to be with them. So she wants to go over to the Medina side. So when they leave the daughter of Hamza, Ibn to Hamza, she comes running out and she begs, you know, the Muslims to take her. And so Ali and Ja'far and Zayd ibn Haritha, they all had a, uh, a bit of a, not a fight, but you know, like, I will take her, I will take her. Each one is saying that we will take care of her. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, it was given over to Ja'far. To Ja'far. Uh, and so this is that daughter. And so Ali is saying, why don't you marry? Because this is the daughter of Hamza, is the cousin of the Prophet, right? This is the cousin. So uh, why don't you marry her? And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam responded, "She is not halal for me. Even if she's my cousin, she's not halal for me because she is the daughter of my foster brother, Hamza, and the Prophet sallam are of a similar age, similar age, and the same lady fed Hamza that fed the Prophet sallam. What was her name?" No. Who? No, 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 no. That's that's the real foster mother. Nobody remembers. I don't want to say the note taker because <laughs> I got five comments even today. Look at my Facebook <laughs> about you, Thuwaiba, the uh, the slave girl of Abu Lahab. Thuwaiba, the slave girl of Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab had a slave girl. And she fed the Prophet ﷺ and Hamza. Uh, and this is before Halima entered the picture. This is before Halima entered the picture. So because of this, Hamza and the Prophet ﷺ are, are foster uh, brothers. وَعَنْ عَلِيَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ قَالَ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ ذَاتِ يَوْمٍ جَالِسًا وَفِي يَدِهِ عُودٌ يَنْكُتُ بِهِ So one day the Prophet was sitting and he has a stick that he was just, you know, playing in the sand with. And he raised his head up and he said, there is not a single soul amongst you except that its actual place in Jannah or not is already known. Meaning Qadr. Everybody, uh, I, I mean, Allah Azza knows it and the angels know it. So we said, O Messenger of Allah, then why should we do anything? Fafim al-amal. What's the point of action? 
So the Prophet ﷺ said, اِعْمَلُوا فَكُلٌّ مُيَسَّرٌ لِمَا خُلِقَ لَا ثُمَّ قَرَأَ أَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى وَاتَّقَى وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسُنْ يَسْرُ لِلْيُسْرَى وَأَمَّا مَنْ بَخِلَ وَاسْتَغْنَى وَكَذَّبَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسُنْ يَسْرُ لِلْعُسْرَى Now this is a very beautiful hadith which I have spoken about in detail in many halaqas and lectures and khutbas. Uh, the question that everybody asks, Muslim and kafir who believes in God, everybody, that if everything is predestined, then why should I do anything? And the Prophet ﷺ was asked this question directly from the Sahaba. And Ali was there. And Ali is saying, I was there and we said to him, why should we do anything if everything has been predestined? And the beauty, the Prophet's answer is not a philosophical justification. He didn't go into the abstract because you will never understand Allah's qadr. And he simply said, I'malu. Don't think too much. Do what you need to do. I'malu. Don't think too much about why, how, what. Do what needs to be done. فَكُلٌّ مُيَسَّرٌ لِمَا خُلِقَ لَهُ Whatever was your qadr, you will find that you're going to be going down that route. You don't know it. But that is what's going to happen. And then he recited the verse, whoever believes and does good, Allah will make it easy for him. Whoever is stingy and uh, rejects, then Allah will make things difficult uh, for him. Uh, the next hadith uh, that uh, one of the tabi'een says that, uh, I uh, attended a janazah with Ali ibn Abi Talib in Kufa, and he told us that كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أمرنا بالقيام في الجنائز ثم جلس بعد ذلك وأمرنا بالجلوس. This is a very beautiful hadith that mentions some fiqhi aspects. Perhaps many of us are not aware of. Ali رضي الله said that we used to be commanded by the Prophet to stand up when a janazah would pass by, but then. He abrogated that and he began sitting down and he commanded us to sit down as well. So in early Islam, the fiqh ruling was whatever janazah passes by, stand up for it. Okay, so this was the ruling in Islam. We're supposed to stand up for janaiz. And then afterwards, afterwards, this was abrogated and we're not commanded to stand up. So we may sit down. So Ali is telling us this. And we find, by the way, other Sahaba narrating. So the famous hadith that we hear, that a, a janazah of a Yahudi passed by. And the Prophet ﷺ stood up. Because at that stage, they would stand up for every janazah. So when a Yahudi janazah passed by, he also stood up. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, this is a Yahudi. Meaning this is not a Muslim, this is a Yahudi. In that time frame, when he would also stand up for a Muslim, he stood up for Yahudi. So then he said, wasn't it a human? Like, it was a human, even if it's a Yahudi. It was a human. So the sitting down is now for all, but this shows us that we may show respect to the dead, even for Muslim, non-Muslim, it doesn't matter. A dead person is a dead person, we show respect to the dead uh, person. Uh, the next hadith we'll get to. وَعَنْ عَلِيٍّ قَالَ ذُكِرَ الْخَوَالِجُ قَالَ فِيهِمْ مُخَدَّجُ الْيَدِ لَوْلَا أَنْ تَبْطَرُوا لَحَدَّثُكُمْ بِمَا وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ يَقْتُلُونَهُمْ عَلَى لِسَانِ مُحَمَّدٍ قُلْتُ أَنْتَ سَمِعْتَهُمْ مِنْ مُحَمَّدْ قَالَ إِي وَرَبُّ الْكَعْبَ إِي وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَ إِي وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَ uh, One of the tabi'oon uh, said that the khawalij were mentioned in front of Ali ibn Abi Talib and he said that uh, amongst them will be a man whose hand is disfigured. And I talked about him last time. His hand will be uh, disfigured. And were it not for the fact that you would get a sense of pride in your hearts, I would have told you exactly the blessings that the Prophet told me in fighting this group. I said, did you hear this directly from the Prophet ﷺ? And Ali said, I swear by the Lord of I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, I, I, Ka I heard the hadith directly from uh, the Prophet ﷺ. So again, the Prophet ﷺ had told Ali about the uh, coming of the uh, khawarij. Uh, the next hadith that وعن علي قال بعثني رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى اليمن وانا حديث السن قال قلت تبعثني إلى قوم يكون بينهم أحداث ولا علم لي بالقضاء قال إن الله سيهدي لسانك ويثبت قلبك قال فما شككت في قضاء بين اثنين بعد In this hadith Ali said the Prophet sent me to Yemen to be a judge and I was still a young man So I said O Messenger of Allah you're sending me to a nation that might have people older than me, and I don't feel qualified to be the judge. 
لا علم لي بالقضاء I mean I feel like overwhelmed You're sending me to be the judge And so the Prophet made dua That Allah will guide your tongue And make firm your heart And so after that I never had any doubt When I made qada between two people That I'm making the uh, correct decision I'm making the correct uh, decision uh, And the next hadith that uh, One day the Prophet passed by me And I was sick and I made a dua to Allah and the Prophet heard this dua that, Oh Allah, if this sickness be my death, then allow me to die now in ease. And if it is not, then allow this to be raised away immediately. And if this is a test that you're testing me with, then give me sabr. So there's three options. If I'm going to die, let it be quick and swift. If no, and it's just something happening, then immediately remove it. And if you're wanting to test me, then give me the sabr to pass the test. So the Prophet ﷺ said, what did you say? Repeat it. And so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, sorry, Ali repeated to the Prophet ﷺ the dua that he made. And uh, when he heard this dua, the Prophet ﷺ made a dua for Ali. Allahumma afihi wa shfihi. That, oh Allah, cure him and heal him. And Ali said, I never had that pain in my life again. So this is another dua for Ali radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made uh, for him. Uh, and Ali narrated that uh, one day he gave the, or one of the people narrated that Ali gave the khutbah or the, gave a lecture in Kufa. And he said, who amongst you heard what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said on the day of Ghadir Khum? So 13 people stood up in the Masjid in Kufa. And they said, they, they testified that they heard the Prophet Sallallahu say, مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَاهُ فَعَلِيٌّ مَوْلَاهُ Now we talked about this hadith when we talked about the hadith of Ghadir Khum. We Sunnis affirm it. Unlike the Shia claim, we don't affirm, we affirm it. And it's right here and I narrated it to you. Ali radiallahu an in the Masjid of Kufa asked, and there are hundreds of Sahaba, who amongst you were there on the day of Ghadir Khum? And remember, who can remind me? Ghadir Khum, who can remind me? So the Shi'i interpretation is that Ghadir Khum is the most important wasiyya of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Ali to be the Khalifa after him. Okay? That it was at Ghadir Khum, according to the Shi'i interpretation, and this took place on the way back from Hajjat al Wada. So they say that the Prophet ﷺ gave the wasiyya to Ali, that he's going to be the Khalifa. And we say, we also believe in Ghadir Khum, we also believe the hadith is authentic, and the hadith is simply talking about the blessings of Ali. And it was a dispute that took place between some of the people in the Munafiqun and Ali, and they attempted to basically deceive Ali in a transaction. And the Prophet ﷺ stood up and defended Ali. And he said, whoever protects Ali, I will protect him. And whoever does not protect Ali, then I will not protect him. So, مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَاهُ فَعَلِيٌّ مَوْلَا If you have, if you think that I am your Mawla, then Ali is also going to be your Mawla. Meaning me and Ali are together. It's as simple as that. There is no connotation from our perspective that this has anything to do with the Khilafah afterwards. So we also affirm this as well. And also, by the way, even Ali radiallahu anh has never used this to indicate that uh, he is somehow superior to uh, Abu Bakr Umar. This has never even crossed his mind. And nothing has been said of this at all. وَعَنْ عَلِيٍ قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ الْمَهْدِيُّ مِنَّا أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ يُصْلِحُهُ اللَّهُ فِي لَيْلَ this is one of the most important hadith about the Mahdi. We Sunnis also believe in the Mahdi. And this is one of the hadith about the Mahdi. Ali radiallahu anhu said, The Prophet said to me, The Mahdi is from us, the Ahl al-Bayt. The Mahdi will be from us, the Ahl al-Bayt. So the Mahdi will be from the children of Ali radiallahu an, And most of the uh, Ahl al-Sunnah, Ibn al-Qayyim and others mentioned this, believe that the Mahdi will be from the progeny of Hassan. And as for the Shia, they say from the progeny of Hussein. 
and they have the twelfth Imam as the Mahdi, as you know, the twelve Shia, they have the twelfth Imam as the Mahdi, and he is from the progeny of Hussein. For Sunni Islam, most of the Sunni Muslims believe that the Mahdi will be from the progeny of Hassan, not Hussein. But that's a minor technicality, it's from the from the progeny of Ali. Whether Hassan or Hussein, progeny of Ali. And of course, we believe that the Mahdi is a regular human being, that he will be born a regular birth and die a regular death. The Shia believe that the Mahdi has been alive for 1,100 years and he's hiding somewhere in a cave in Iraq and he will come out before the end of times and they have their theology around him. So he's alive right now and he's been alive for 1,100 years according to the Shia and he will remain alive until the, 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 the trumpet is blown. The same human they believe, uh, the Mahdi, uh, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Askari they call him uh, and they believe that that is the 12th Imam, the hidden Imam, Imam al-Ghaib. And as for us, we believe that uh, and they give him, of course, powers. They give him powers of creation and powers of uh, yani miracles and whatnot. And in fact, there is the, 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 the Shia folklore, the legend, is that the Mahdi travels around uh, the world and he blesses his followers. And so you will hear this very commonly among the, the Shia. And there's very common folklore that, oh, my, my son was uh, you know suffering, whatnot. And a nurse came and we didn't recognize the nurse. And then when she left, my son was cured. That was the imam, for example, right? Or some, some, such and such happened and I was about to be run over by a car and somebody just pushed me and the, the car went behind me and I was saved. That was the imam. Because the imam can take forms. The imam can take forms for the uh, twelve verse. It's not just one form. And so they believe that the imam is constantly helping their... Uh, the, the, their followers by their mi- mi- miracles all the time but he's never going to be recognized until after he leaves nobody will recognize the imam when he's there because then he wouldn't be the hidden imam okay uh, I'm going into my tangents we're not really interested I know you guys want to hear these stories but that we're interested in this hadith from us who is the Mahdi regular human being and he will lead the world against the Dajjal before the coming of Isa that's the main characteristic of the Mahdi for us. We'll need a leader. We'll need a leader. And that will be the one person that the Ummah will unite behind. That we want you to help us against the Dajjal. And this, this um, phrase, يُصْلِحُهُ اللَّهُ فِي لَيْلَى is very interesting. What it means is that in one night, the Mahdi will be corrected. And our scholars have interpreted this to mean that the Mahdi will grow up not as practicing as he should be, believe it or not. We have a very different concept of the Mahdi. He's not superhuman at all. He'll grow up and he might not be as religious as he should be. Now, this is my intuition and and tafsir, and Allah knows if it's true or not. This probably means that he's just your average Muslim. Inshallah, he's not going to be a major sinner. It's just like he's just barely praying the five prayers and just living life. And then one day, he will reach the level that is muttaqi, mu'min, muhsin. This is yuslihu Allah. Allah knows best. Linguistically, you could say that he's a fasiq and he's going to become the muttaqi overnight. This is also possible. But Allah knows best. It's just a complete feeling that I have. And sharia is not based on my feelings, so definitely not. But Allah knows best. Yuslihu Allah fi layla. Mediocre Muslim, average Muslim, praying five times a day but no interest with anything else, right? Just the average Muslim. And then in one night, something's going to happen and he will find a personal commitment and he will then become Rajul Salih, right? So this is going to happen in one night, which means that he will not grow up like that, but he will become like that. Uh, and uh, and so the hadith is basically that the Mahdi is from the Al Al Bayt, from the uh, from the uh, family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam We're getting close to time And we have so many ahadith left I guess we'll do this one The final one Or maybe a few more We'll see But um, <coughs> uh, Nujay uh, says from his father These are all tabi'un taba tabi'un From his father That we were walking with Ali radiallahu an Towards Siffin And we passed by the city of Nineveh And Nineveh is the t- city of Jonah in Iraq Right, city of Nineveh and we pass by the uh, Euphrates River. And so Ali stopped. And he said to the people around him, Isbir, wait here. And he called one of his, uh, the, the narrator, Abu Abdullah. And Abu Abdullah said, what is the matter? Why are we stopping here? 
Why are we stopping here? Listen to this hadith, one of the really bizarre hadith. And it is in Muslim Imam Ahmad. And um, some scholars have made it slightly weak, but the concept is definitely authentic. And even if this version is not authentic, other versions have the same concept. He said, One day I entered upon the Prophet wasallam, and I saw tears coming from his eyes. I said, O Messenger of Allah, what is the matter? Has somebody caused you to be angry? The Prophet wasallam said, No. Rather, Jibreel was with me before, before you came in. And he told me that Hussein shall be killed at the bank of the Euphrates. Hussein shall be killed at the bank of the Euphrates. And uh, Jibreel said to me that, do you want me to give you some of the uh, sand, some of the sand from the Euphrates to smell? So I said, yes. So he stretched forth his hand and he got some of the Euphrates, uh, earth or soil. And when I smelt it, I could not help but cry. I could not help but cry. Now, there are a number of ahadith in our tradition, these are our books, that clearly mention that the Prophet ﷺ knew that Hussein would be killed. There are a number of ahadith. And in one of them he said that my members of my ummah will kill my grandson. So we believe this, that these are something that he did indeed uh, predict. And if you remember my Karbala lecture, you can listen to it for those who are not here. I kept on emphasizing that we are the true supporters of Hussein. And the people who call themselves his allies and his supporters, the fact of the matter is they were the ones who abandoned Hussein at Karbala. And that should never be forgotten. We weren't the ones who promised. We weren't the ones, they were the ones who did that. And that should never be forgotten. We have nothing, and they unfortunately accuse us of being the followers of Yazid. And we are not the followers of Yazid. As Imam Ahmad said, does any mu'min love Yazid? This is Imam Ahmad saying, does any mu'min love Yazid? We are not the followers of Yazid. And we despise the killers of Hussein. And Hussein is our imam with a small eye. We don't believe in imam with a big eye. He is our leader and our, uh, and our imam that we look up to. But the point being, from these ahadith we learn that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi knew that, the, uh, that uh, Hussein would be um, uh, massacred uh, or uh, killed. We have so many other ahadith to do. Um, so let me just... Uh, okay, I wanted to do this one about the Khawarij. Let me just do the Khawarij. Uh, so uh, Abu Kathir narrates that I was with my master Ali. So this is one of the servants of Ali. I was with my master Ali the day that he fought at Nahrawan. So this is the Nahrawan battle. And it was as if the people felt something about killing all of these people. Because remember the battle of Nahrawan... Almost zero casualties from the side of Ali and over two, three thousand uh, on the side of the Nahrawan, or maybe a thousand. We don't know the exact numbers because, as I said, remember last week I said many of them simply left because they were given the chance. Remember, these were Muslims outwardly beards and looking righteous and religious and whatnot. And so there was this sense that we killed them. So Ali said, Ayyuhan Nas, O people. The Prophet ﷺ told us that there would be people that would leave this religion like an arrow leaves its prey. And they would never come back to the religion. And the sign that these are the people is that there's going to be a person of a darker skin color whose hand is mutilated. One of his hands is mutilated and it has a tumor on it. So go find him in the dead. So this is Ali giving the hadith and they haven't found the man. So he goes, I know this is the battle, I can tell you, and he told me there's going to be this man with this tumor on his hand. Go find him. So he doesn't have one hand, instead it's like a tumor. It's some type of, and he, there, in some hadith there's description, there's dots here and this and that. So that he's describing the tumor in detail. So says, go find the man. So they found, they, they kept on finding until finally they found him, uh, as I showed you last time, three times they, stood, they didn't find him. This hadith doesn't mention that. Other hadith mentioned three times they didn't find him. Then they found him in a ditch next to the river underneath the other 
dead. And they took it out, or they took the man out, and Ali said, Allahu Akbar, Sadaq Allahu wa Rasuluh. Allahu Akbar, Allah and His Messenger have spoken the truth. Allah and His Messenger have spoken the uh, truth. And Ali began uh, poking the body with his uh, sword, and he's saying, Allah and His Messenger has spoken the truth. And when the people saw this person with his tumor, what not, exactly as Ali described it, the people also began saying, Allahu Akbar, and they felt good, and the feelings that they had about this battle being negative were removed from their hearts. So we have here, and I guess we'll have to conclude here, we have here one of the reasons why the Prophet predicted this. So that on the day of the battle, those that killed these fanatics and got rid of them, they would realize that this is what Allah and His Messenger want. That the less we have these these people of the Ummah, uh, the better it is for us. And inshallah with that we will uh, conclude with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Uh, as I told you, we are not doing a history of the Khulafa. So I will not go on to Hussein next week. Rather, we will, or Hassan or Hussein, rather we will continue with the Ashra Mubashara, uh, the people who promised Jannah. So we've done Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. Inshallah, next week we'll do uh, one of the others. I Talha or Zubair, I haven't decided, but we will continue with the 10. And inshallah, then do other of the Sahaba. Eventually, we'll do two or three Sahaba in a day because. The fact of the matter is most of the Sahaba, we don't even have an hour-long lecture that we can give. Most of them. Uh, in fact, in fact, it is true to say the bulk of the Sahaba, we just know some names and that's it. We don't even have even that much. So eventually we'll be doing that and then we'll inshallah move to the mothers of the uh, believers inshallah.